All right, I wanted to give my bit, uh, and it's a really um, a response to uh, the Blue Hour and his question, what is the difference between 64-bit and 32-bit? Now, I was going to uh, have this um, in my review of Leopard, as Leopard is 64-bit now, because a lot of people do ask this question, what is the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit? Well, to really answer that, I at least in my opinion, to where uh, you people have a better grasp of it other than saying, well, you can do more. Um, I mean, I think it's just too much, of a, it's too simplistic of an answer. So I'm going to go back uh, a little to the history and um, go over some of the technologies that actually got us here to where we can ask what is the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit. First, I'm going to start off with a bit. A bit can either be a 1 or a 0. So it carries with it a base of 2 and because it could either be the 1 or a 0. Uh, this is part of the binary language or numerical system, however you want to call it. And 8 bits make up a byte. Or you can call it an octet. Both are known within computer lingo. I believe the first, one of the first systems, I'll say, was a 4-bit under Intel. And so we're going to take these bits that I was talking about, whether it's a 1 or a 0, and imagine that you have a maximum of 4 bits because it's a 4-bit system. And imagine, if you will, a pipe that is 4 bits wide, meaning that is as much as you can send to that pipe. And when the pipe reaches the memory, the amount of unique values that can come out of 4-bit would only be 16 positions within RAM. So what do I mean by all this? Because a bit can be 1 or a 0, we take 2, and we simply fact it's up to a power of 4, so you're, you're factoring out. And you get 16 possible unique values. In any one of those 16 combinations, you can create instruction sets. Obviously, you can't do very much with such a limited instruction set. <clears throat> instruction sets come down and basically communicate between RAM and the processor. So, you're not only limited on the pipes, like I said, but you're also limited in the amount of addresses that you have in RAM. Because you only have 16 available positions. From there, uh, the 4-bit didn't last that long, and it went to 8-bit. So, 2 to the power of, the, of 8, you have 256 unique values. Obviously, a huge difference. So now, our pipe went from 4 bits wide to 8 bits wide. And we now have 256 possible uh, unique values. And when it reaches a RAM, 256 different addresses that we can hit. And this is real simplistic, uh, an explanation. An address, you can, if you will, could be, uh, you could make it analogous to your own home address. Everybody has a house, which is a specific address, and in it we store our instruction sets, or what have you. Um, or any of what, one of those values, one of those unique values of the 256. When we went from 4 to 8 to 16-bit, to 32-bit, to 64-bit, and coming 128-bit. So you can see that we're increasing the width of the pipe, meaning more instruction sets can be can come and go, and thus the available RAM that it can use gets much larger in terms of addresses. So, like I think 16 bits, we have around what's 65k something like that available in RAM. So, when and why is it always going to the bit? Really, well. The, we usually break down the bit in terms of octets, like I said before, which is a byte. And so when we when we say like um, four bit only had well, I won't include I won't include four bit, but I'll, I'll, let's say eight bit. Eight bit is one byte, so it has one octet or one byte. Sixteen 
32 has 4 and 64 has 8 so you can kind of break it down into these octets and thus you have your your width or, or bytes of, of these pipes okay everything that you do on the computer eventually gets broken down into binary and that's why it is so crucial that we have the maximum amount possible on on the bit side because all of this binary gets converted all the way up through assembly and all that through symbols all the way up to seeing words on your screen and the more possible unique values the more that we can do so yes in a simplistic term yeah 64 can do more than 32 simply because its pipes are bigger um, the and this and this and this goes in, in, into RAM because RAM is where we get things stored. It goes to process, comes back, and then and we see it so on and forth. This process goes on and on and on and on, and um, and this then leads me to you probably come across arguments where they're saying, well, 32-bit can't address more than four gigs of RAM, and if you do the math, you, it, it comes out to, to four gigs. Now, that's not necessarily true because in today's operating system sometimes the OS actually reserves a part of memory and so if let's say if you were you were to lose uh, we'll just say a half a gig for instance and you already have four gigs in your computer you could technically replace that half a gig and again restore the full mathematical limit of memory addresses this also gets me into uh, virtual RAM, swap files, so on and so forth, uh, because I'm sure you've heard of that. Virtual RAM is a way of fooling software and thinking it has a, a larger memory pool. And from there it gets messy. Like virtual memory could use a, a, the physical RAM or use parts of a, of, a, of a paging file where it will swap an active and active programs um, in order to get what it's trying to tell the software that it has. Uh, you've, you've done this a lot in Windows, and you'll sometimes see, oh, Windows, I'm running low on virtual memory. <laughs> Basically, the virtual memory is running out of places to go, and it's asking for a larger page file so that it can use some more of it, so it can swap more. Now, 64-bit um, uh, goes to an enormous amount of, of RAM from 4 gigs. I mean, you're, you're, you're jumping tiers at this point, too. I mean, you're jumping around to around 16 exabytes. So to give you an idea of exabytes, you basically have two tiers in between a gigabyte and an exabyte, which would be a terabyte and a petabyte. So it gives you <laughs> an enormous amount of available address space. So you can only imagine where 128 is going to take us. Um, but that is, that is the, the gist of it. Uh, we go from simplistic binary 1 or 0 that form simple instruction sets creating more complex instruction sets then they move up into other we'll just use variable symbols that represent those instruction sets those symbols then are also represented by other symbols so on and so forth up until you to your everyday computing that you know and see on the screen and I myself as a programmer would love to have the maximum amount of unique values that we can going on down to to the bit level so that we can simply do more uh, store more you name it um, and, and that and that's really the gist of of bit computing um, I mean they could use another name where it breaks it down into the octets and the bytes and instead of bits we, we, we call it bytes but I mean that, that's just the the way it is um, for now um, so getting I, I'll touch on CISC and RISC uh, because those have to do with instruction sets and, and, and computing. Um, I believe IBM was was heavy with the RISC, which is um, reduced instru instruction sets computing, and then CISC is complex instruction sets computing. And this has to do with an argument that really is now marginal uh, on the way instruction sets were sent back and forth, and which was more efficient and faster, and so on and so forth. Many will probably still debate it today. Um, but at least, at least to my knowledge, it's 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 fairly mar marginal at this point uh, in terms of results. So 
you can look it up, say ISC and RISC, and getting into instruction sets with that. But I hope this explains the difference between 32-bit, 64-bit, or any of the bits, whether it's 8-bit or 128. Thanks for watching.